Hey everyone, we have a very special episode for you today. A few months ago, we were contacted by the Make a Wish Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to granting life changing wishes for children with critical illnesses. They were reaching out to us on behalf of a young boy named Evan who loves the command zone and wished to be a part of this show in some way. So last week, after months of planning, Evan and his family flew in from Virginia and arrived at our studio in Los Angeles to kick off two days of commander-packed fun. We spent the first night gathering all of the Game Nights alumni from the area and jamming games of EDH into the wee hours of the night, and it was a blast. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Make-A-Wish and the kinds of cases they take on. Evan suffers from tuberous sclerosis complex, or TSC, a rare genetic disorder that causes tumors to grow all throughout the body. His condition is not terminal, but it is very serious. He's already had brain surgery twice, he suffers from frequent seizures, and TSC is something he's going to have to deal with for the rest of his life. But despite all of his health difficulties, Evan is an amazing and upbeat kid with an infectious laugh. Just a pleasure to be around. And trust me when I say, he's a commander aficionado. Yeah, the dude is no joke. You gotta be on your toes when you're in the game with him because literally anything might happen. He even runs a magic club at his local high school. So the next day we had yet another special surprise for him. Mark Rosewater, head of magic R&D, stopped by to hang out, play commander, and record an episode of the podcast, which you're about to watch. Wizards of the Coast, Card Kingdom, and Ultra Pro also all generously donated tons of swag for Evan to take home with him. We're talking sleeves, deck boxes, play mats, booster packs, you name it. We can't thank our sponsors enough for being part of this special day. I mean, look at that smile. It just doesn't get any better than that. So we hope you enjoy this week's episode. It was Evan's own idea for a topic, and we're honored to help bring it to life. And please stick around after the episode if you want to learn more about Make-A-Wish, the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, and how you can lend your support to kids just like Evan. Greetings, humans. You have entered the command zone. Your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Radioactive, radioactive. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm radioactive, radioactive. Yes! That was the best song we've ever sung. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which tells you how good are the rest of our singing is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well... Hello, everyone. Welcome. You're watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. Today, we have two very special guests. We have Evan Moss. He's here visiting us from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Hey, everybody. Evan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome, pleasure welcome. To be here. Evan actually came up with the topic for today's show and uh, came up with a lot of the bullet points and everything, two pages. making our life easier. I always appreciate that. You're welcome back anytime, Evan. <laughs> and of course, sitting beside me is one of the founding fathers. He's on the Mount Rushmore of oh, magic. magic? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's Mark Rosewater. Hello. Wow. How does that feel to be put on a mountain? I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> rocky. Something. <laughs> Indeed. So Mark is here visiting. You're going to go to Comic-Con tomorrow. I am. I, I have a big announcement uh, this weekend. I'm talking about what the uh, the fall set's going to be about. Ooh, actually, by it's, the... it's a good one. Yeah, by the time you see this video, you will have heard all of the news about it, so that's very yep. exciting. So they don't know yet, so they don't. Yeah, we, yeah. we don't know yet, but... I don't want to spoil the surprise for myself. I'll be watching the panel or reading the tweets about it when it comes uh, Saturday, right? Yeah. Very yeah, nice. I like that panel every year. I won't be in the audience this year, though. I'll just be following somebody else live tweeting, probably. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be live tweeting. Okay. It's my Very favorite cool. part of magic announcements. You get to see pictures on Twitter of a picture on the projection screen. So it's just <laughs> as, as far away as you can get, but you're like, I can feel the excitement. Are there going to be, I don't know if you're allowed to say, are there going to be some cards? Are we going to see a card or two? Uh, Not exactly. Okay, <laughs> all right. I won't push you on that. <laughs> we'll see art. So oh, Ed, You'll see a lot of art. Excellent. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, Evan... You came up with this topic. You run a, a, like a play group at your school. Is that correct? Yes, I do. What, uh, how's that work? Um, well, we at my middle school started a Magic the Gathering club. Uh, it carried on for two years, and then we moved into high school for it. Oh, so nice. it's, it's carried on through high school. You followed from middle school to high school? Uh, well, it's my first year, so uh -huh. I don't know if it's going to continue next year. But <laughs> If there was any impetus to keep it going, I hope this podcast gives it that necessary, you know. I mean, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> the, Hopefully. The nudge. Yeah, yeah the nudge. Knock so today one. we're going to talk about some common mistakes that new commander players make. 
Evan comes in contact with a lot of new players, not just new to Commander, but new to Magic also. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to do a little section on sort of teaching and shepherding new players into Magic and then specifically Commander. Uh, but before we get into all that, we got to give a quick shout out to our sponsors. If you go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone to order all your Magic products, singles, anything at all, you really are supporting this show game nights, all of our content. And Ultra Pro as well. As you can tell, we all have amazing playmats, all oh, printed by Ultra Pro. The, I got the best one by far. Anime it's Soren. Anime Soren. <laughs> by the way, Mark, I want to know, do, do, were you a fan of like the whole anime? Oh, yeah, yeah, very it's much. pretty sweet, right? Yeah, yes. Sweet. I don't know who made that decision, but please give them a high five from me. Yeah, it was originally done by the Japanese office just solely as a thing to promote in Japan. Oh, cool. And then we saw it and we're like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I want those. <laughs> <laughs> it passed culturally on. So yeah, Ultra Pro as well. And of course, the final way to support the show, patreon.com slash command zone directly. And we shout out one lucky patron every single month, week, week, every single week. We do it every month too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just four times a month. <laughs> and this episode is dedicated to... Aspen, Aspen Ramirez. Ramirez. Aspen. Aspen. You rock. Thank you. All right. Into the main topic here. I think whether you're like new to Magic or just new to Commander, or maybe you're a veteran player who is dealing with some new players, mm -hmm. that this all these little tips will be helpful to you. So um, how big is your how big is your play group, Evan? Uh well, it we got somewhat actually big burst at the last meeting at the school year, uh, and it got to about one dozen. Wow. wow. So you got about 12 people. It's better uh, than our playgroup. <laughs> <laughs> How many people would you say are like new to Magic or new to Commander in, it, in there? Probably about half. Yeah. Oh, so a lot. Yeah. So a lot of you are sort of teaching the other ones how to either get into Commander or do you play mainly Commander? Or is we it... uh, almost purely play Commander. Nice. Good man. Good man. Okay. <laughs> and you're the one that shepherded the love of Commander in. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Um, before I came in, uh, we had two other people at the club in middle school mm -hmm. who played commander and we had about three or four other people in that club in general and i played commander and then a few other people from the other tables came to watch and they were like hey i want to do that is you said you had like the last meeting of the group basically was one of the larger ones do you think like you're seeing a lot more new magic players is because of arena or something like that um i think that's possible i mean i think it might just be that you know, magic is growing in general. It is. <laughs> Confirm. Are we seeing that across the... I mean, I feel like I'm seeing that right now across... I mean, ma magic, uh, the, the, the last quarter, uh, so our second quarter of mm -hmm. 2019, was the best magic's ever done. Ever. Ever. Like in the history of... Yeah. Holy moly. So, wow. a lot of people are playing magic. <laughs> yeah, I remember when you did a poll as well on your Twitter, Mark, that was competing, like, limited versus commander. It was such a tight race. Do you yeah. think commander is actually pulling ahead now? Uh, I mean, Commander keeps growing, yeah. you know. Um, I mean, the, there's a lot of just different audiences, and I think Commander is absorbing more and more of the casual crowd. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, it keeps getting bigger, so. Yeah, and it seems great for high school clubs for a great reason for people to play, you know, in a multiplayer setting as well. Do you think that's something that appeals to a lot of the kids at the school you're at? I think it does. I mean, we have a lot of gaming clubs, mm -hmm. and by that I mean, like, card game, board game, and video game, and... A lot of the ones with more than two players are doing a lot better. Ah. People just like the social interaction. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 1v1 is pretty intense, I'm not going to lie. I, I like playing with more than <laughs> two people. That way when I'll, I lose, I'll, I can always blame it on I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting focused either way, so. Yeah, there you go, there you go. Yeah, as the senior player of the group, right? All right. So, uh, Evan, you sort of started a list of things that, I think one of the, one of the things Jimmy and I have run into is, as we've done the show more, we don't come into contact with new players as much because if they're online already like Googling best commander deck and yeah. finding our stuff, they're already out of the new player phase. Yeah. And so I thought this was a good opportunity for us to sort of talk about people who are new to commander and new to magic in general and give some tips because I do think arena is causing a lot of people to discover magic and then now walk into their LGS or walk into maybe like a, a club or something at school and be like, oh, I sort of know how to play and I'm, I'm ready to try this. Yeah. And so I think it's good for people out there to sort of know how to handle that, right? Yeah. yeah. It's good to know. Yeah. I so, think a lot of this applies to, even if you're not going to play Commander, a lot of these tips apply to just regular 1v1, whether you go to a pre-release, or just want to play in general and want to you know, up your game a little bit. So, Yeah. Oh. Also, something that's very common is a lot of times people know you play Magic, and then if they're interested, they'll come to you and say, oh, I'm interested in learning. Could you help me learn? That's a very common. Right. We, we track how people start playing Magic. And one of the most common ways is a friend teaches them. That's a very common ah. way to learn. So. Or that's through a club or something like this, right? Yeah. 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 Perfect. Yeah, that's how I learned. I was in high school, and 
my friends were playing and there was four of them and they were like, well, there's five colors in Magic. This is literally 1993. <laughs> and they were like, we need, a, we need a, the fifth color. Uh, so guess what color? they playing Circle? They were. We were playing okay. multiplayer from the beginning. Wow. I mean, there was no rules associated yeah. with how it worked, yeah. but it wasn't, yeah. And of course I got green because that's yeah. the color nobody wanted at that time, but uh, <laughs> that's how I learned. They were like, well, do you want to be green? And I was like, I don't know what that means, but sure. Um, so that's exactly how I learned. I think that's You're it. green to the format yeah. and green. It's in funny the game. because yeah. our, our stats say that green is the most popular beginning player color. No well, way. I mean, back in, yeah. back in like uh, uh, Unlimited, sure, green, sure, green sure. was not that great. Yeah. That's what are you talking true. about? Giant growth. Best card in Magic. <laughs> I mean, Mark, you brought up that mm-hmm. green is one of the most popular beginning colors, and I would like to second that. I've seen a lot of new commander players play mono green. Mm. I've also seen them play ghoul or simic a lot. Right. Well, what we've learned is that red and green, by the nature of what the colors are, are just a little more direct. Like yeah. green is play creatures attack and red is, you know, throw Roll lightning bolts, bolts, whatever, you know, throw direct damage and play some small creatures where something like blue, you uh, have to blue react. Is a very popular est- established player color, right. but beginners are like counterspell, you know, it's, just, it's yeah. complicated for them. So yeah, it's I just very complicated. Straightforward yeah. with my play. I just want to turn my creatures sideways and bash you. Yeah. So it makes like total sense. Um, so. We're going to go down the list here of some things, Evan, that you've noticed that new commander players, maybe common mistakes that they make. Uh, the first point you have is lack of removal and hate. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, of course. Um, I've noticed a lot that new players, they aren't prepared for when their game plan doesn't work out. They don't respond a lot. And mm-hmm. they are focused, which is good. They know what their deck wants to do. Um this is one that kind of actually contradicts one of the later ones, but uh, if they're focused, they don't remove creatures. They don't have wrath. They don't have single target removal. They don't have mm-hmm. artifact removal. They don't have enchantment removal. Sometimes they even leave out artifact enchantment ramp. Right, and you wrote here that being able to disrupt your opponent's plans are really big. Do you think that because sometimes, and I had the same thing when you make a first deck, you're like, I want to do this and this is all I'm going to do. If someone else disrupts their plan, they sort of get an idea of like, oh, maybe this is something that I need to be doing to other players as well. Yeah, and you guys have brought this up somewhat on the show recent, uh, not recently, but just mm-hmm. in general. Um, Josh, you've harped on Voltron a fair bit because one <laughs> removal spell, it's gone. Um, and that's that feels a lot like this. But a right. new player building Voltron might, and they say a new player builds now set. They don't give it any way to get instructable. They don't give it any way to Protect. come back or right. anything. Um, they just want to make now set as big as possible. Yeah, I think, you know, I even do this sometimes now where it's like new commander comes out. It's really sweet. And the commander says, you know, I want to do X, whatever the thing is on it. And so I think of these millions of cards and they're all going to work with my commander. And then you get into a game and somebody's like, no, nope. di- plays a dictative Erebos. And you're like, I can never remove that thing, and it <laughs> yeah, just turns off my deck because I didn't think. Because when you're building a deck, you're not like, I'd, well, you know, it would be really exciting if I had three disenchant spells in my deck. Yeah, but you still need those spells because what do you do when they play those silver bullet cards against you? Yeah, and I mean, this that's the same thing. Like even me, I have a feather deck, and yesterday I played a new taste deck, and they played a dictate Erebos on me, and the Phaseosia comboed with it, and was just like I was never, I was never able to keep feather. Right, and. You can't deal with that. And I was trying to dig a lot for those enchantment removal spells. Yeah. Right. You, you need to have them in your deck. But, I mean, I've had decks where I, like, because I was in that same game with you, and the dictate was really bad for me, and I had a, a tutor spell, basically, for a creature. And I'm like, well, what do I have? And I looked through my entire deck. Nothing. I don't have a creature <laughs> that can do anything about it. So it's just like, you know, that's bad, bad deck building. Don't do that. But... You know, I think this is a good lesson that even veteran players can learn, which is yeah. like you need to be able to, you know, no matter how well you build your deck, sometimes they're going to play cards that you have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we're coming back to this. A lot of this is deck building. And a few of these, even veteran players can fall into repeatedly. Right. And I have, I will admit, I am somewhat new to Commander. I've been doing it for about two, three years. Uh-huh. And I am still trying to get over a few of these. So. Yeah, I think one of the big things that we wrote down here in the outline, too, is that sometimes people, like a card like Dictate of Erebos against a Voltron deck, that card just feels unfair. You can't yeah. give your creature indestructible to get around it. But, you know, R&D throughout its history has created ways for any color, almost for the most part, to be able to deal with troublesome enchantments or troublesome cards that they can't deal with. So, yeah. But also, that's why Sagawada is so good. Right. It can't cause you to sacrifice. It can't cause yeah. you to sacrifice your commander. And then you give... I'm just gonna... 
rant a little bit here. You give Scout <laughs> indestructible. You give Scout a shroud. You can't sacrifice it, and you just lose. We <laughs> have a Scout deck in my play group. I am definitely accusing them. Okay. So the. Uh, <laughs> so what? What kind of card would you like to see us make? <laughs> <laughs> or should we go to okay. just says Cut no Sigarda, yeah. I had a question for you, Mark, because yeah. this is probably something that you run into, which is I think new players have a tendency to see a certain effect and just because they're new, their brain mm. just kinda goes, That's unbeatable. Yeah. That card's too powerful. It's unfair. Yeah. I mean, ma magic is designed to be what we call rock, paper, scissors, which is there's an answer to everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. I mean, not every color is every answer, you know, but the idea is the game is built so well, here are threats and here are answers to the threats and Right, when you're building a deck, you want to not just think about your threats, you want to think about your answers, because part of playing, especially in Commander, is a lot of back and forth. Right. Um, but there's a lot of cards in Magic, and there's a lot, a lot of <laughs> answers. And a lot of times it's funny that if you have a problem and you start researching, you'll find some very clever solutions when, you know. Mm -hmm. um, like I know today they were talking about it, in fact, on online, and now we don't really let you remove poison counters like one time oh, leeches did it way, way right. long ago but yeah. there are cards that like prevent you from getting counters or there are things that can remove counters from the opponents and that right. you could maybe team up with somebody but the idea is you have to be creative when you're looking at solutions because th there's a lot of magic cards and a lot of times the answer is something that's a little more sometimes it's very direct but sometimes it's oh here's an answer but it's not quite as obvious a little roundabout way yeah. of going about it yeah, yeah. and it, the nature of it being a singleton format means you don't need to play four ofs so you can have yeah. four different answers in slightly different ways to different things and being flexible that way i think is a great thing to teach new players especially to being like don't get frustrated get creative Yes. I like that. Don't get frustrated, get creative. Yeah. Let's make a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, genuinely, that's probably the most important thing to teach new players. Mm -hmm. Don't get frustrated for one game. It won't happen every time. Right. Get creative. You can work around it. All right. So the next point on this list is a little bit related. It's lack of focus. So, Evan, you mentioned that new players have a tendency to, for their deck to be sort of overambitious, try to do too yes. many things. I have seen new players bring in to me i've seen most players most new players when they build their own deck they have two areas one they focus in on one area and forget to leave anything else out this right. is the new player building a zuri they put in soul ring simic signet and then the rest creatures <laughs> um the other one is what i call the brea deck uh, -huh. uh because brea of course can do everything New it's players true. want to do everything. Right. They right. don't focus in on an artifacts theme. They they don't dig down for the artifacts. They might just be like, oh, I wanna have some life gain synergies. I wanna have these synergies where maybe I can put in some spectacle cards. Right. Well it's like these are these are cool cards, they fit the colors, so why shouldn't they be in the deck? Yes. Right, right. Mark, you were a writer, you were a screenwriter. Uh, yes. This is something in all creative disciplines, and especially in like writing and creating yeah. that I find, which is like you have to make choices. Yeah. Yes. Right? You have all these ideas and these this B plot and this C plot and whatever, yeah. and you have to be like, yeah, but there needs to be one major through line generally for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, none of it works. Like if yeah. you try and do too much stuff, then you do nothing. Yeah, well, uh, in, in writing, they teach you that uh, if you write a scene, if you take the scene out, will, will it work? And if the answer is yes, then then take the scene out. Then why is it oh, there? I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't serve a purpose. Makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. it kind of makes sense with deck building too, because a lot of times we've talked about this as kind of like um, synergyception, kind of like how many layers right. can you go away from your main plan before it starts to actively hurt itself. Yeah. yeah. So like if if something's like my main plan is to make tokens with this deck, so I'm I can have a bunch of stuff that deals with if I have a lot of creatures mm -hmm. that works. But then sometimes people will add in like, oh, but I'm going to be sacrificing my tokens. And I also want to be like, uh, I don't know, like using them as fuel for something else. Or like some of the tokens I'm creating are artifact tokens. So, so put in an artifact something. I'm going to put in an artifact yeah. something. And now you're like so far away from the token making thing that like right. the artifact synergy, synergy cards are like two steps from the token making. And that's just going to, it's going to jam you up more than it's going to help you, right? So yeah. many times you're going to have the artifact synergy card like, Court Clan Ironworks or something, and you're like, well, I made Zapperlings. Those aren't artifacts. This card does nothing. <laughs> yeah. I have tried so many times to make, like, say, for the Boros Commander that partner with each other. I don't remember which Sunfire, they are. Sunfire, Sunspeaker, and Fire. Oh, oh, no, oh the, the, the partner ones. Yeah, the partner ones from Battle Bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't the, know the names. Dragon and the Knights. Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. I've tried to make yeah. one of those, and I've tried, I've tried to make a deck with those, and I've tried to make a double tribal theme. 
but it just ah. doesn't work. You you have to put in so many choose a creature type effects that right. you have, like you play this choose creature type. It costs one less to cast or two less to cast or whatever. But it only synergizes one half of the deck and yes. not the other half. And then like for the knights, you put in the co- the arms, coat of arms, coat of arms, right? And then it just doesn't work. Because too often you draw one half of your deck and it doesn't match with the other half yeah. of your yeah. deck. And I, just... yeah. I was playing it once, and I had drawn all of my dragon tribal cards <laughs> and all knights. <laughs> I had, like, one dragon the entire game, and it was my commander. <laughs> Not where you want to be. Another real common thing I know is when you have a theme, mm-hmm. and so you pick things that go with the theme, but those things contradict each other. Oh. So I'll use your Go Wide example, yeah. which is Go Wide works really well with Sacrifice, or it can go really well with team boosting, but those two things don't go together. Right. So you have to sort of pick which direction you're going. Like if I want to make uh, go wide with sacrifice, that's great. If I want to go wide with boosting, that's great. But they're anti they're anti synergistic. Even though right. both of them go with your main theme, they don't go with each other. Yeah. That's another thing you have to watch for is that your supporting themes match each other. Mm. Is that a thing in design where you kind of give those choices to players so they can figure that stuff out? Or is that a thing where you don't try and give them those choices so they don't get tripped up? Well, the way it works in design is you figure out your main themes and then you weave in synergies. And those those synergies don't need to go along with each other necessarily, but you just want to have enough synergies that things can combo together. So for example, let's say we're doing a set that has a, a go wide, you know, there's a lot of token making or something. Mm-hmm. Maybe black is sacrificing creatures, and maybe white is pumping creatures. So, like, well, if you're going to build it with black, you go this route. If you're going to build it with white, you go that route. And so, if different colors are doing different things, that's fine because you, you pick and choose what colors you're going to play. Right, because you can't, you don't have the freedom in more limited environments yeah. to go super, super deep. I color. think on this topic, what I would recommend to players doing this is that your commanders cover determine where you go. Don't let your commanders affect where you go. That's the cover. If you want to build a token deck then maybe you go with ta- with the new Tesa if you want to go a bit aristocrats. Right. If you want to go token and pump, maybe you go with Rist the Redeemed. Or maybe you just go with a Selesnia commander. Uh-huh. I, let let the, the commander sort of give you the roadmap of like what, yeah. what choice so you don't have to be like, I, the world's my oyster, I yeah. can do everything, I'll try and do yeah. too much. Yeah, that makes sense. Personally, again, I try not let the commander influence it as much. I try and let the color influence Oh, okay. Yeah, I think overambition is definitely something that players can very easily fall into just because if it's your first deck ever, why wouldn't it do everything? You know, and I also think sometimes someone watches a show like Game Nights or someone watches someone else play a deck and like, wow, they did X cool things, but I only have this commander. Can I make this do that? And so you kind of get caught in this dilemma of it's like, well, I only get to make one deck, so I got to do everything. Mm -hmm. I think being able to limit yourself just is going to create more fun play opportunities too because you're not going to find yourself in those feel bads where you draw half your dragons and none of your knights. Or vice versa. Yeah, you're better off making a dragon deck and then making a knight deck, probably. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. What I've done with stuff like that before is I've done a swap out. Mm-hmm. So I have like, okay, I take out my dragons, pawn my knights. Oh, nice. So you can just make it more focused one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. So the next uh, common mistake or the next piece of advice for new commander players is synergy versus power. So you need to strike a balance. I think... There's this idea, and it's often true that like synergy beats like raw power of a single card, but not always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, not always. Under uh, the, uh, you, I would you rather have you... an it to be trace than a <laughs> pay one mana get a one one. Right. Even right. if the one one's an elf and I'm in an elf deck, still right, if right, it be right, trace, right. it will often just be better. Is that what yeah. you mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you had something you called the creature dilemma, Evan. Do you want to talk about that? Okay, this one's prominent in just a few commanders. Like I'm going to use the example of Azuri. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Simic one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll pull up the card, I think, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you play small creatures, Azuri gets experience points. And, and then, then you can pump them Zuri with one so one name cards, they pop up. Yeah. 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 Anytime you say a card name, someone's going to have to be like, oh, here we go. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to name all the cards uh, now. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I use the creature demo as putting in too many creatures. Right. Right. Going back to my friend's deck, he plays an Azuri deck with 30 lands. A soul ring, a simic signet, and then all creatures. And then everything else is creatures. <laughs> like 60 something creatures. 60 something creatures. Right. I think he needs more land, but yes, continue. Um, <laughs> probably watch well, some instance in sorcery that, in there. That right? happens a lot. He's super lucky, like every time though. Soul ring, simic signet. Every game. <laughs> How many mulligans do you allow? Yeah. <laughs> Enough until you get a soul ring, simic signet, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this could. 
the creature dilemma could be the ins- the artifact dilemma or the yeah, well, whatever, it can be right? Anything because even in a brand deck, you're not having sixty artifacts, right? Probably, yeah, right. right. You want some other things, and I think yeah, it's really easy to look at like Animar or something mm-hmm. that yeah. wants creatures. You still want some other stuff, yeah, but it's still strong, uh-huh. but could be better, right? Like maybe you have may- maybe this kind of goes back to what I was saying with let the colors choose. Because if you let the colors choose rather than the commander and have the com- just have the commander be a synergy piece, then you won't fall into this. Right, you're going to, because you're in green, you're going to have some rampant growth and stuff. Or yeah, you're in blue, yeah. you're going to have you Cyclonic like Rift, yeah. you have... We're all thinking of the same card. Why does he have Cyclonic Rift? I thought the Beast Within was <laughs> know, my green card. <laughs> I mean, in fairness, this is a somewhat budget play group. So, right. I'm just going to warn you, Evan, that going on shows like this and telling your friends to make their decks stronger will not make your life better. No, it's actually yeah. a very good oh. point. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Typically, this I'll is the kind of snake that bites itself. Rather than Psychrift. <laughs> yeah. Good um, luck next time you guys meet with your play group. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, most of them don't watch this show. Oh, good. Oh. Wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Can they? We they're going to watch this episode. Yeah, they're going to watch sure. this episode. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure. Uh, okay, let's move on to the next point here, and this is one of my favorite ones on the entire list. Yeah. It's that politics as a resource. I think in Commander specifically, uh, new players don't really think about that axis as one that's available to them as mm-hmm. an advantage that could be gained, and they don't, um, you know, they're just concentrating on their cards. And I get it, because especially when you're new to Magic, yeah, it can be... You have your deck, you yeah. don't think of anyone else's. Yeah. yeah. Unless, I'd say, unless the card specifically says, you know, join forces or something that's going to ask you Tempt, to work yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah. someone else. Otherwise, it's just like, this is my plan, I'm going to enact that. But then, here's the thing. A lot of new players, in the same vein as this, I've noticed that none of them play, like, join forces, tempting off, or nothing. Mm-hmm. They don't think, like, oh, I might be getting it off this. But so will my opponents. Right. So they, they see the asymmetrical effect and they think, I don't actually want that. Yes. I want just the thing for myself. And this is kind of, I like new plays because they build really weird and fun decks. Mm-hmm. But they never think to use politics. And they always think you're going to betray them. How do you feel about politics in, uh, in I know, Commander right? Mark? Yeah, it's it's R&D. I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think one of the cool things about Magic is that there's a lot of different ways to play. Uh, and I think the thing about multiplayer play is it, it's a multiplayer play is politics. I mean, unless you have defined roles like two at a giant or something where, right. you know, um, and that one of the, th- for example, one of the things that I always say is think about what targets. And then one thing about multiplayer play that's different in a political thing is if it's a target effect, sometimes the correct answer is not using it for myself, but bribing somebody else of trying to get somebody else to, you know, help you, you'll help them. Right. Mm-hmm. Yesterday oh. I had a soul of discord on two of my opponents, thanks to DJ. I was one of those <laughs> thanks opponents, to DJ. by the way. He was one of those opponents. He ended up killing the soul of Discord. But I couldn't attack Josh. We had made a deal. We had made a deal. Uh, and he so found a DJ was like, hey, also of Discord him so that you can kill Josh and him. And then I'm all open for you. And I'm like, perfect. And he's like, I'll also give you an extra attack step. And I'm like, what are you getting out of this, DJ? <laughs> He's like, absolutely nothing. Okay, two, that's two do of this. my opponents dead was what he yeah. was getting. Yeah, or yeah. a good time, as some people clarify it as. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but I think that's uh, that's a situation where Evan and I had made a deal where he couldn't attack me for one turn because I had not mm-hmm. destroyed his thing or yeah. something the turn before, and, and it was then helpful to DJ to get you out. So right. that was me thinking of a way to use politics as a resource. If I don't do this, then yeah. I'm free to do something else and I get what I want, which is not getting attacked. And yeah. then DJ was like, I can also use politics as a resource. Mm-hmm. I'll make it so you can attack a different player so you're still upholding your agreement with Josh, but it'll still hit Josh. Ah, you know? that and makes that sense. Is... And it would still deal the commander damage because I was playing Feather again. Right, and when you play with veteran commander players, they're often like, okay, I got the cards in my hand, there's the cards you have, and then there's what I can talk people into doing. Yeah. Right. And I think the new commander players don't think on that last level. They're like, yeah. I know what my cards are, I know what your cards are. Uh, that's all that the options available to me. But a lot of times it's, you know, what are Jimmy's cards and how can you use those to help me? I can see this being a very intimidating thing too, right? That's a good You're point. sitting down at the table for players. You don't really know anyone. Are you going to try and convince someone to do something? Especially, I think another thing that new players fall into is uh, what if feelings get hurt? What if someone breaks a promise and then they take it outside the game? So I would say if you're trying to introduce politics as a resource to new players, you can keep it very simple. 
don't attack me for a round for this. Yeah. Or all like one for ones, right? Not like complex setups. Like if you don't do this, I'll do this and this and this. And then at that point, you're going to do that, right? Which like I think would just be very overwhelming for new players. But I do like the very basic just like, hey, look, don't attack me. I can help you. Or don't do yeah. X, I'll do this. Yeah. So it's like a very easy transactional exchange. The big thing for politics, and this is true for all commander players, and not not just new players again. Like I've seen a lot of veteran play groups that don't use politics. Think of politics as free value. Like you can use politics to get free cards. You can use politics True. to get free damage on Josh. Um, free removal spell on someone else that's not out of your deck. It's yeah. someone else's. Yeah, it's helpful. <laughs> Mostly yeah, use it against Josh. That's that's the key. <laughs> and usually here. the key to politics is explaining to other people why helping you helps them. Right. Yeah. 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 If you don't do that, why are they gonna do it? True. I often like starting with like a question too. Like, who are you gonna attack with that? That yeah. starts a conversation. They have to respond. Yeah. You ask them a question, and that's a soft way that's in. And an like, I'm gonna right? do this or you do that, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a lot easier to be like, ask a question. Who are you gonna attack with that thing? Or do you have a removal spell? Or do you yeah. have a way to deal with that? That's a question they're gonna respond. That starts a dialogue. There you go. You're politicking. One thing I really like to do is put yourself in the shoes of someone else. So, for instance, the Dictative Erebos is out, and you're playing Feather. I'll go, oh, man, Evan, that card's really bad for you, isn't it? Like, you only have one creature. And then that asks the question almost for the player right. in a way. But, you know, maybe it affects you, too, in which case, Josh, like, it really did affect you there. So it's a good way to get... It was get... bad for both of us. It was, it a good, was it's really a good... bad for both of us. <laughs> yeah. You had Meek Stone, too, though, so... I think the It big didn't th matter because your, cre your commander just died every round. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe my favorite use of politics is is general like awareness so everyone understands what's happening so everyone can at least make a more and better informed decision as a group. Yeah, a very common I think early politics thing is I'm about to die and you say to people, would having me stay in the game be better for you, you know? Right. Me it does me dying help one player more than it helps other players. Hey, maybe it's good for everybody but that one player to keep me in the game. Yeah, very true because if somebody's like way in the lead, a lot of times if, let's say there's three players left and Jimmy's way ahead yeah. and Mark and I are behind and Mark's about to die. It, it's actually good for me to keep Mark in the game because my chances for Jimmy 1v1 are not, yeah, as, not good as good as, as 2v1. 2v1. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, good point. Unlikely allies. Now, Josh and I want to take a moment to tell you about the Make-A-Wish Foundation. It's an organization that grants life-changing wishes to kids with critical illnesses. Now, Evan is just this amazing, smart, and articulate 15-year-old kid. On the surface, you'd never know he's had multiple brain surgeries, suffers from chronic seizures, and has too many tumors on his kidneys to even count. And sadly, there are a lot of kids out there facing similar extreme health struggles. If you want to get involved and support these children, we encourage you to visit wish.org. Or if you want to know more about Evan's condition, we've included informational links to the Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance in the show notes below. These are both amazing organizations that are only made possible through the support of people like you. There are many ways you can help, from donating to volunteering. So please find the links below and trust us when we tell you there is nothing like making a difference in a kid's life. All right, the next point is play to your style. So... Build decks that emphasize what you enjoy about the game, I think, especially when you're new. Yeah. I define my style as I don't care if I win as long as I make an impact. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. If I make an impact, I'm happy with that game. I am fine losing if with my feather deck, and this didn't happen last game, by the way, just it to almost, clarify. Yeah, you knocked somebody out. Um, <laughs> I mean, I did knock somebody out, but I was dying uh, a few games ago uh, in my home play group. And at instant speed, I had Gutter Snipe on the field. Oh, Gutter Snipe. Very good card. Very good card. Very, very good card. And I ca cast a chain of five spells. And I didn't take anyone out, but I made a huge impact on that game because everyone was at like 20 life. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it just changes the landscape so much. Yeah. And then next turn, someone else lost, I think. But anyway, that was enough for you in that game. Yeah. That, you, like, got yeah. you got an I assist. <laughs> it was fun because <laughs> I dealt so much damage to everyone right and right. that that's how i find my style i don't care if i win and lose i won't make an impact right and you would think about that when deck building maybe to be able to do mm -hmm. like explosive things so that your yeah. deck always has a chance to like just kind of go off we have a spike in the play group all he wants to do is win and we have a player who all he wants is a story he wants that fractured identity on that crazy random the yeah. walker or whatever on the, it is yeah on the ugin the spear dragon on the nickel boss god pharaoh right so he has the story <laughs> element to it yeah. And Mark, you guys have done a lot of psychographic, I guess, mm -hmm. profiling of who the, yeah. the things are. And those have changed over the years, too. Have you found that there's like a really effective way for a player that's new to be like, this is what I really like? Or like to go into the game and like, I like blue, but I don't like what blue does, but I like what red does, you know, like sort of that. 
Well, one of the things we haven't really talked about, so I'll bring it up here, is if you're going to introduce someone to the game, the most important thing is that they enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. That not, not, Nothing else matters, and that one of the things when you're teaching people is... They must have it, fun. It doesn't... Yeah, if, if yeah. they're not having fun, they're going to stop playing. And so a lot of times people prioritize other things. So if you're helping someone make their very first deck, make it something they'll enjoy playing, because right. odds are they're not going to win a lot you know, when they first start playing, but... Are they enjoying it? Are they having fun? And and that really is important is, are you doing things that you enjoy doing? Right. And like the different psychic graphics want to do different things. That's fine. But figure out what you want to do. Mm -hmm. what, what makes you happy? For some people, it's doing some big, splashy, crazy thing. Like one of the things that I, I find is making yourself a little goal. It's not necessarily winning, but here's a goal. Before the game ends, I want to do something. I'm going to make a deck and I want to do something. Right, right. And that winning doesn't have to be your only goal. And when you're first starting out, if you make smaller goals, it's like, what? Well, I want to make at least 20 creatures. You know, I want right. to make a whole bunch of tokens. And even if I lose, if I make 20 creatures, I've won to myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that, I think, is important when, with beginners is give them smaller goals to achieve. So, A, that they're doing something that's fun, and then they, they can win even if they don't officially win. Right, totally. Yeah, it, like, I lost my first game, but I had so much fun because my game was built around an uncard. And it was <laughs> the, <laughs> cheese, one? the cheese stands alone. <laughs> That's got to make you happy, Mark. Come on. It does. <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing is he could have played with, with uh, Baron Glory, which is the same card. Yeah. But no, he played with the, the cheese stands alone. alone. <laughs> um, so and, real, real quick, sorry, this is very funny. We, were, we almost had um, unglued. We were talking about uh, Boeing in Japanese. Yeah. Uh, it ended up being just in English. And so for a while, we were joking as the cheese has no honor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's amazing. The translation. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, you ready for this part, Evan? Oh, yeah. It's the oh, best yeah. part of the show. Right. Right. We yeah, throw toss it. it. Three, two, one, go. Yeah, we're done with that page. Everybody Four, made okay. it off the table. I'm not sure whose that was, but okay. So this last one I added. Oh. Because I feel like, well, I feel like new players have a problem with this in Commander I specifically. Agree. Yeah. It, 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 it feels bad sometimes, right? Well, yeah. You yeah. shouldn't. So I'm going to just give you all the new players, new Commander players permission. It's okay to win. Go ahead. Josh uh, said no, it's okay. It's Josh no said it's okay. okay. <laughs> no one else cares if you win. They want you to win. They want you to enjoy yourself. In the way that you also want yourself to win, and you want other people to win and enjoy themselves, too. And it's also, also okay to lose, right? Same same token. Yep, yep. But I think new players do have a problem. Like, I've seen so many times where, like, hey, you could you could get, knock that person out of the game, and they're just like, no. Because it's, like, kind of, like, feels like it's nice to not do it, and, you know, a lot of times new players are new to the group, and they don't know everybody as well, and they yeah. don't want to be quote-unquote mean, so the it's like, I'll let Jimmy live, and I'll attack Evan, even though Evan's at 30, and this would knock Jimmy out or whatever. It's okay. Go for the win. Try to win. It's totally fine. You have permission. No one's going to get mad. Hopefully. You know, yeah. <laughs> They're going to shuffle up, and you're going to play again, so... Well, this actually happened Don't last feel bashful night. about that. We played a couple of extra games, and there was a point where Murph kept a hand that only had six drops, and someone had a very aggressive commander, Skullbriar, and by turn six, before he could even play anything, he was at three life. <laughs> and and the player was, oh, I feel so bad about killing you, and the player goes, it's my fault. Yeah, I don't, Murph's like, just like, kill me. <laughs> just get me out of this game. I didn't do anything. <laughs> he kept like, a hand kept with all six hand. drops. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, so I think like even veteran players fall into this, and it is a kind of a feel-bad moment, because... I think a lot of times you put yourselves in the other person's shoe and you wouldn't want to get eliminated in a way that's unpleasant for your, you know, general experience. But we're all going to be in that situation, especially as new players, you're going to find yourself in that situation on both sides of it. So it's okay to just, you know, Sometimes try and Sometimes you're going to lose when you have two mana. Yeah. And no lamp. Yeah. <laughs> and the game does have to end eventually. Yeah. 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 In fact, the game would be awful if it never ended. <laughs> I mean, definitely there are times, I think as you play more, that you kind of spread around the damage and you and you let everybody have a good time. But I think new players particularly have a problem understanding at the point it's like, not nah, just go, just knock people out. Yeah. We need to be wrapping up. You know, that's the point in the game this is. And if you don't do it, you're going to get knocked out anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Although this is a high school club and kids got to go home. You know, there's See, families. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. We, but the club, go do homework. the club yeah. asked no, 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 no. <laughs> the club asked a good three hours. Though. Okay, that's great. So, that's enough for like one and a half games. <laughs> <laughs> two games. No, no yeah, two with, games. with me, it's a decent half game. Half game. <laughs> you played pretty fast. We played last night. You're not Oh, so you haven't seen my extra deck. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so those are the, the tips. I oh, We threw the paper. I was going to go over them, but never mind. We'll list them. Somebody yeah, yeah, will yeah. list them real quick. Or just go back and watch the episode again. You know? But we wanted to talk about uh, a little subtopic here, which is how to teach or encourage brand new magic players. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mark. Um, and this is something, Mark, you're really good at. And this is something 
I haven't honestly done that much recently. Um, which is, you know, if nobody's if somebody hasn't played Magic at all mm-hmm. or very little, maybe they've tried out yeah. Arena a little bit. So we wanted to talk about again because there's a lot of people now that are coming into Magic because of Arena might ask you. You made a really good point. They probably know you play Magic, and they might come to you, yeah, and be like, "Hey, how do I play? How do yeah. I start?" So, like the the number one thing, and I think the most important thing is starting simple. I think the first time I ever played uh, Commander was. I played Magic growing up. I grew up in Seattle. We played on the sidewalks. I knew how the game worked, and someone gave me a commander deck, and it was an unpleasant experience because I didn't know any of the cards. There were so many new interactions. There were three people playing cards I didn't know, and on top of all of that, my skills were rusty. I didn't know what the phases were. So the best thing I think to do when you're teaching someone that starts out is to really pare it down to what the game is about. Super simple. So what I would do normally is I would take the, the Goblins versus Elves dual decks, I would take out lands and take out every single instant in sorcery so just the creatures remained. And like, we're going to play a game and both of us have 10 life. And so we would explain creature combat and they're like, all right, let's play another game and we'll add in sorceries. Let's play another game and we'll add in instants. And sort of tearing it up as you go because even if you like watch the arena or play the arena playthrough, it's very similar. It's like we're going to work through one aspect at a time. And I think Commander is one of the easiest games to have someone overwhelmed by. And in that case, if that happens with their first game and they don't have a good time, like Mark said, they may never come back to the game again. So starting simple is by far, I think, the most important part of, of learning how to play Magic. So let me jump in to sort of reinforce yeah, this. Please. Um, so what is the number one reason people will start playing and then never come back? Too Nine. complicated? They are intimidated. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, what happens is people are like, I want to play this. And Magic is an intimidating game. Yes. It's complicated. It's, I mean, there's 20,000 cards in existence. <laughs> it's a complicated game. Some of them have like a whole book on them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so what Some happens is when people come to Magic, most of the time, Some of them they're over. aware of, even though they don't know the details, they're aware of it's this very big thing. Yeah. And that they know the people they know who play are very into it. And that it's very intimidating. Right. So the number one reason people will not play a second time is they f- they don't want to look bad you know they, they, they people want to feel like I can present myself and I understand what's going on and so part of keeping it simple is the core part of magic isn't actually that complicated yeah like when I teach people to play the number one thing they'll say is oh that that's not that hard because <laughs> the actual core of the game isn't now right. later on you know I mean you can layer on lots of things to make it very complicated but when you want someone to play boil it down to the basics mm-hmm. yes. and once again make sure they have fun. And don't, if someone enjoys the game, they'll learn more stuff later. Right. A lot of times people feel like, well, I got to teach them everything before the first game ends. And the answer is, no, you don't. <laughs> Only teach them things they have to know to play the game you're playing. Right. Teach them no more. Um, and the other big thing I like to do when you're teaching somebody is understand what about the game they might enjoy. For mm-hmm. example, if they're really into the art, you can lean into that. If they're very into the story or very into the color, like whatever you think they might like. Make it more about that because you want them to have a good first experience. Yeah. The other big thing, and the reason um, like Magic Gathering and Arena I think is a great teaching tool is the judgment of other people is one of the things that make people feel bad. So one of the reasons that playing a computer is really good is <laughs> people don't feel judged by the computer yeah. and they can make mistakes and they can do things. So that's why I think Arena is a very good teaching tool because when you get to play by yourself and make mistakes but no one's watching you – you feel much more comfortable doing that. Yeah, yeah. you're not going to get the side eye from the AI. It's like, yeah. be like, Ugh, why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cat might look at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so short story real quick. I came in on Magic Origins. Uh-huh. Um, and my first deck uh, I got from a deck builder's toolkit. Mm-hmm. I opened all the packs, and I got a really powerful elf deck. Um, it was green back, and I had this one card that put me into it, and it was one green back. And it had amazing art, and it dealt damage equal to the number of elves I control to my opponent. Oh, right. And it was so fun. It was so great. And what I always do is I take that out, hand it to the new player. Oh, you player. still have the deck now? I still have the deck. Uh-huh. I hand it to the new player, and I say, this is a simple deck. You can play this. I trust you that you can play this. And I do it, and I play a mono blue tempo deck of my own. Uh, I take out all the bounce spells and counter spells and everything like that. And it just boils down to Tempest Jins, a few flyers, right, not it's, much. It's, it's attacking and blocking mostly. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just a really fun experience for both of us. My recommendation to people who are trying to get new players into the game is to have a designated new player deck. Right. Something that you know is not going to be intimidating or too crazy yes. at the start. Yeah. That's why I really like those dual decks. They sort of take core things and just 
boil them down to also like, oh, do you like goblins? Great. Do you like elves? Great. So you kind of have a theme to go around. And too. those are very archetypical. Yeah. yeah. You know, fantasy things fantasy too. Fantasy tropes so. that like you can grab onto even if you don't know. So yeah. it's like at least you sort of know. Like, Everyone knows what the dragon is. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Um, so slightly contradicting you in one thing. I do think when you first start playing, um, I would put sorceries and not instants in, but I do think you want a few sorceries when you first start playing just because spells are a big part of the game. And yeah. they, they kind of teach people like, oh, yeah. there's other stuff going on. And so usually when I first touch people, I'll put a few sorceries in. Uh-huh. I, I'll leave instants out usually when I first touch. Instants are very the complicated. stack is too hard to well, I mean, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> You can wait to, for them to learn. You can re- respond yeah. to things. Sure, that yeah. can come later. Uh, one thing I like that you said, Mark, which was don't try and teach them everything all at once. Like, yes. I think people, whenever they're teaching anything, this is a really good uh, piece of advice to take, which is make sure that they're grabbing onto the core concepts. And what happens if you just throw too much at somebody? They don't. It's like the deck building thing too, yeah. you know? It's like if you try and do too much, nothing sticks. Yeah. Try and do a little bit really well. Make yeah. sure they understand like I, you know, how the casting costs and the mana lines up and maybe yeah. how attacking like make them make sure they hold on to a couple core concepts rather than being like you got to understand everything about the game in this one play sitting. What well, one of the things I also talk about is think about teaching in anything, right? right. Yeah. So if I was going to go to a dance class or something, they're not going to say before we. Here's all ten dances you could learn, right? right. <laughs> you would pick one dance and a simple vert. Like the key of teaching to somebody is picking a, a microcosm of what you want and making sure they enjoy that and, and then that, build on it. You'll build on. It. I mean, if they enjoy playing the game, they'll learn stuff. But you don't like. Let me explain layers. Like, <laughs> yeah, you just yeah. don't need to explain real complicated things up front. And if they're having fun, if they're enjoying themselves, they'll come back and want to learn more. People invested will will be excited to learn more, but. I think one of the biggest problems I find with beginners is because you're so excited and you want to see all the aspects of the game and you want to talk strategy and all these things that are just above their head. Take your time. Yeah. You know, get them wait. into it first. Just yeah. wait. Um, well, that, that's a really good point too because a lot of times the beginner will ask you questions that yeah. is actually not good for you to answer for them. So they'll say things. Or at least well, not what, in full detail, like, yeah. Yeah, a lot of times I'm just like, Hold on, we'll get to that. You'll learn it eventually. But let's make sure we got this down first. Yeah. Or, or give, like, like um, my mom used to do a lot of court testimony. One thing they said is, say whenever they ask you a question, answer the question of the least number of words you can answer. There you, go. <laughs> you know, and so that, it's the same when people ask you questions, which is try to give yes or no answers and not let me explain why. You know, yeah. Let me tell I you a story about yeah. the one time. Should yeah. I attack or not? Yes, you should. No, you shouldn't. Yeah. Not let me explain the strategy behind it. Like, <laughs> let people, me give you all the corner case scenarios <laughs> that you might I not do, be thinking why of. Why say if they? I'm going to use an example. They have two one ones, mm-hmm. and I have a two two. Yeah. They are asking, should I attack? And I say, well, <laughs> I have a two two. I can kill one of your one ones. Is it worth it? I mean, I, I would say as news players, sometimes it's like, well, I do want to get the damage in. I think a lot of times it's just it's just one of those things where it's like, why not try and see what happens, right? We're, we're we don't need we can have a take back if you want. We're not playing this game to like have it like a full on rules, whatever. Let's see what happens so you can even understand through the, you know, it's sort of like, hey, I tried this dance move, but I slipped and I fell. Like, well, great. You learned a lot when you slipped and you fell, yeah. but in magic, no one's getting hurt and you can always take it back too, I think, with new players. Yeah. I, I like the take backs idea too. Try it, learn from it. You'll learn the strategy. Don't try and explain the strategy all the time to them. Let them do stuff and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, w- one of the big things uh, in general when you are teaching somebody is, thinking about the experience from their end and what what they're trying to get. Mm-hmm. And that um, when you're excited by something, when you really love something, there's a desire to want to share things. But it's just a matter of doling out when and how and where you share things. Right. And that you just don't want to overwhelm them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say one of the most, the biggest takeaways from this is that if you decide to be a teacher and someone that teaches someone how to play magic, there is actually kind of an onus and a, and a burden on you and that you are going to be this person's first impression of the game. So it's really, really important. So do to, a good job. Yeah, no, yes. I mean, yes, do please, please do a good job. We want more players to play Magic. But yeah, I mean, you are in control of a very sort of pivotal first impression of the game. And a lot of these things are very important. Because I know you're excited about the game. You have a lot of things that you're excited about. But if you are going to convey that excitement to someone, you need to do it in a way that to make sure that they understand it. Like, it's almost like, let's say you have an extremely evolved palate. You When you, when you eat foods, you only eat the finest foods. But you're trying to introduce you. You give someone the best steak of their life, and you're breaking down every single part of it. It's like you could also just let them enjoy the steak and not have to talk about how it was cooked, why it was cooked this way, what kind of sauces were used. Like all those things are not 
important to the core thing, which is I'm here to enjoy eating this piece of food, or I'm here to enjoy playing a game. And so try and focus on what initially drew you to the game, find out what they did as well. But your experience is going to be very, I guess, important for their, I guess, mental awareness of yeah, the game It's a big well. responsibility if you're teaching somebody to play magic, right? Because you're trying to bring them in this thing we all love. Yeah. So don't accidentally turn somebody against <laughs> the game, right? I like yeah. the stake Somebody now- I could play commander with later. Yeah. I like the stake analogy too. And this is a great one. Because you like steak, right? Well, yeah. But (laughs) um, if you can't stop talking about the steak, buy them a pizza. Oh, as in like give them something else in case the the steak is not their their jam? (laughs) If steak is red, then pizza is green sort of thing? Well, (laughs) if steak is blue, pizza is green. Okay, all right, all right. So here's another good tip. This is just a good teaching people tip. Okay. Which is... um, you saying something is not as powerful as them asking you something and you, uh, you answering. Yes. Right. Because when people ask questions, now they're invested in the answer because they ask the question. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they want to know. Yeah. Right. So when you're teaching somebody, it's much better to not talk at them and just let them guide the conversation, let them ask the questions because they're more invested if they're the ones that are sort of dictating what's being talked about. And they're curious about how something works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, two more little tips here we have. This is stuff you brought up, Evan, that I like, which is, um, you know, when somebody's starting out, it's really good to let them use your decks. Like you said, you even carry around decks. You had some last night that you almost pulled out. I have for... I have five Stato decks that I always carry with me. Oh, cool. Just and... in case anybody asks, like, how do I play this game when yeah. you're ready? Also, sort of on this topic of let them use your decks, uh, I have people use the Elf deck. And then I kind of walk through... At, once they understand everything, I walk through like, okay, so you want about this much of this, this much of this, this much of this, this much of this. And I have so many cards. So <laughs> I make them, well, I don't make them, but if they want, and most time I teach them at my house. I have this card catalog of all my magic cards. And so if they want, I let them try and build a deck and with my cards. And whenever they do, whenever they come back, I always leave it open and tell them that they can change it whenever they want. I had one of my friends, Ryan Sword, he went from a mono green Stompy deck to a Simic ramp deck. And it was well built, is very powerful. And it was all with your cards? It was all with my cards. Yeah. I probably I, couldn't even have built it myself. I find one of the things that new players, there's like a, you know, once they get and they understand the game, the next big hurdle is deck building. A lot of, a lot of players have like, they're intimidated by that part of the process, yeah. right? Like yeah. that's another hurdle that, like, get it. Some players never even cross it. Where we, they they we, never really build their own decks. Which is why we made commander decks. Yeah, <laughs> like we, we literally sell decks. Going, you want to play commander? Here, we'll sell you the deck. You can just play this deck. Yeah, it's, it's a intimidating. Dra- that way yeah. you don't have to start from zero, deck. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you can start from like sixty five percent there yeah. at the very least, or you can yeah. just play that thing and never change it. Yeah, yeah. there's a big dragon deck. It plays dragons. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, I would say a huge number of our episodes are dedicated just to deck building, too. Because, yeah. I mean, like, it is, I think for me, it's the most intimidating part when you're starting out, I, especially when it requires an investment. You have to buy cards or you have to borrow them. So I think what you said, Evan, is actually really important. If you if you are someone that's teaching and you have the ability to build someone the deck or at least give them a start on the collection, because you can build very powerful decks just with commons and commons, cards yeah. that aren't worth that much, cards that you could just go to your LGS and they'll have lying around as well. And I think that's one of the the fun parts about Magic is it's a very generous audience in general. I found that new players, especially at pre-releases, will just give you, I'll, I'll give my draft chaff away yeah. to anyone. Just be like, please use something with this because yeah. I'm not going to, but it's going to bring you a huge, larger amount of joy than it would me. And that to me, it's what's important. Just I mean, get- yeah. So when you're first teaching somebody, if you can give them some cards at the end of teaching them for them to keep, yeah. that is very powerful. Yeah. I have friends who call the LGS, ask when a pre-release is, uh, then they're like, great, thanks, hang up. <laughs> and then they go after the pre-release and pick up like commons and uncommons there. People just, don't want. Yeah, yeah. yeah people don't want. And then they just build a deck from that. Yeah. Just get Yaruk and then put any other cards in there. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, you're, you're good. good. You're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. after that. <laughs> All right. I think that's going to wrap up our discussion. We've run a little long, which is great. Uh, always good. But we always uh, ask a question to our listeners. And this one is maybe obvious. What's your advice out there for new Commander players? What strategies have you used to help shepherd people into the format? We'd like to hear from you in the comments on Twitter. 
in email. I don't know, anywhere don't at know. all. Email. Write us a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Put a stamp on it and everything. Yeah, do people send, still do that? Send What's it all a stamp? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, of course, this show is brought to you by Card Kingdom. So use the affiliate link cardkingdom.com slash commands. And especially, uh, they have their they have their awesome pre-made decks as well. So oh, that's like true. Pre-built experiences. Battle decks. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people understand that Magic's a hard game to get into. So Card Kingdom has done a great job in sort of shepherding that experience, like you said, as well. So you can just check that out. Use our affiliate link. And uh, when you get those decks or when you get your cards, make sure you put them into an Ultra Pro sleeve. Play them out onto a nice ultra pro yeah. play mat. Figure out what the new player wants. Maybe they want this Soren, or maybe they want the game that's play mat. Or maybe they want... Fibble fib. Fibble fib. Fibble fib. Everyone wants the fibble fib. <laughs> I still think the Soren one's cooler, but okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, by supporting Ultra Pro, Card Kingdom, all of our sponsors, you really are supporting all of our content. We super appreciate everybody that does that. Okay, we didn't prep you guys for this. Evan, you might have been ready, though, because you you know we do I'm this every episode, right? I'm assuming what yeah. I know. I'm now assuming. it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the, the world, world of magic. magic. It could be like a book you've read, a place you've eaten, a movie you've seen, anything at all. Evan, do you have something cool that you want to talk about? Well, as they've mentioned earlier, uh, I'm here because you've made a wish, uh, which is amazing. Um, and they, we are here and we've been doing so much outside of Magic the Gathering. Yesterday we went indoor skydiving and it was Ooh, so fun. Cool. <laughs> yeah. What do you like? They suit you up and you're like one of the big wind tunnel kind yeah. of things. Yeah. It's like what is it? It's like a tunnel. Like yeah. I don't know. It's big in this room and they yeah. just blow air at you. Yeah. Right? yeah. Probably a little smaller. Have you done it? Probably a little smaller. My daughter's smaller done. I haven't done it. <laughs> How? Probably, probably a little smaller than this room. Would you How? Would you recommend the experience? Oh yes. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, Dad didn't even know that the person in there was letting go of him. Oh, so, so that was just flying. That, he was just flying. Did yeah. He cr- did he crash and burn, or did he? Uh, a little. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Did you did you do any flips or anything cool like no. that? No, uh, I don't we, think they let this you. Was the, this is the first time. You need to go there like twice at minimum. Josh, we just talked about teaching new players magic, and you're asking if he did flips. I just was the first asking. Time I, just, I was just asking. <laughs> How long do you get? Um, uh, they give you. You can. One sign up is two times, and each uh, time is one minute. Oh, nice! That's how long. That's longer than it, actual it skydiving. Is. Yeah. I've done it once, and you would be. A, it, you are not in control the first time you go in there because you do this or you move a slight hand, and all of a sudden your entire you know yeah, your body you shifts. Do the whole, so you have and to, the legs have to be in the right position. Yeah, and you yeah. really have to the stay control. The first time, all I did was lock my feet. Like I bent them a bit too much the first time, and then after that, I I had one hand signal for correction. Oh, nice! So, so you had it down after that. Yeah. Sweet. I, I went, so at least. I went act, actual skydiving yeah. once, and I think I got like 27 seconds of free fall before, <laughs> we, I, before I had to pull the shoot. Before, you were just <laughs> yeah. screaming the whole time, right? <laughs> I am not be The thing is, you're, you are screaming. I was screaming. I will, I will admit it. But it's still, there's so much air coming at you, <laughs> you that just, you just oh! go, you go, ah! And then immediately your mouth is just crazy dry, and you can't scream anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, do you have anything outside the world of magic? I do. My family did something really cool last weekend. Oh, cool. We participated in the 48-hour film Fest? project. Oh, oh no way. Your daughter is a filmmaker. Yeah, she so makes amazing shorts. My family, my family of five, uh, Friday night at 7 p.m., we got we pulled from a hat. We got one of two genres to pick from. Okay. We got mystery or period piece. We did mystery. Uh, we and then everybody everybody gets their own genres, but everybody had everybody participating. Uh, there was an object we had to have, which was a lanyard. There was a character we had to have, which was Harry or Harriet Biddle mechanic. Uh, <laughs> and then there was a line, which is the depth of your ignorance is deep. Ah, okay. Uh, that every, dialogue line had yes. to be in there. Had to be so, in there. So the line, the prop, and the character. Every single film had to have that. Uh, and then you had 48 hours. 48 hours, you turned it in. Wow, to and film so, it. You yeah. have to write it, write it film it. it, shoot it, edit it, everything in 48 hours. How much uh, hours did you sleep in that 48 hours? Uh, I, we actually got <laughs> decent sleep. I mean, we 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 aimed low for our, our like, we, we were trying to do something. It ended up being like five minutes. And, wow, that's uh, actually, uh, The yeah. movie has between four and seven minutes. Okay. Um, at some point, I will post it online. I can't post it till after the screening. Okay. But okay. I promise I will post it online. I was very happy. I thought we, came, we, we did a good job. That's have you awesome. done one of those before? I ne- never, no, never, never that. Yeah, but your daughter's so. made some amazing videos. I've, I've yes. the ones that you. Well, I mean, but Rachel and I have done videos together, so yeah, I mean, yeah. she, she's great at uh, directing and editing. So that's awesome. Yeah, that's Very awesome. Cool. That's cool. I like all directing and editing. Me too. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Bet you do, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll make sure something else that is directed and edited. My patented segue just got there. No problem. Mm-hmm. Nobody even noticed. Uh, is our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern? Alex Kessler and Ben Bateman. They talk about the modern format. And all things competitive magic, you can find them on Twitter at the MMCast 
Also, probably the best way is just go on YouTube and type in Masters of Modern. They pop right up because they do videos now. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you can find them all also on iTunes, Stitcher, all your uh, podcast, podcast apps. Areas, yeah. yes. Our editors for the show are Ashlyn Rose and Jake Boss, who just joined the team down here in Los Angeles. Big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who does the cool living card animations behind us. You can find him on Twitter at LivingCardsMTG or find his animations at the beginning and end of every show at YouTube.com slash Command Zone Podcast. And you want to watch the video for this because we said tons of cards and then someone was forced to put them on screen. Of course. Also, were. we have three cameras, which we usually don't have yeah, one. Yeah, sure. We I even said about this one. That they did that. Oh! <laughs> uh, Evan, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us on. Well, thanks for having yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, now let's go play some magic. All, All right. right. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. I mean, peace. For your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>